Mr. DeGarren and uh, Mr. Chesnoff and Mr. Lewis and uh, we have uh, Mr. Lewin Henderson, Bailey and Miata Ilias. Um, Mr. Lewin, you wanted yes. to put something on the record before we commence this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, a couple of matters. First of all, so that Mr. Bailey and Mr. Ilias' arguments are not needlessly interrupted, um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, we intend, and I'll be doing this on a rebuttal, to be directly calling the defendant a liar. There is ample authority for that position. Uh, one is uh, Boyette, B-O-Y-E-T-T, -T, 2002, 29 Cal 4th, 381 at 433. Um, the, uh, there's also People v. Reyes uh, at 12 Cal 3rd, 486 at 505, uh, and Edelbacher, E-D-E-L-B-A-C-H-E-R, 1989, 47 Cal 3rd, 983 at 1030. Uh, and in that case, the comment was made, the defendant was a pathological liar and one of the greatest liars in the history of Fresno County. I just want to make sure that the defense understands that is, this is almost unique. We're not even have to make the argument. Mr. Durst has admitted that he literally perjured himself during the trial. So that's the first issue. The second issue is that we intend to argue that the defendant in their opening statement, the defense did not support what they said they were going to support. Um, the authority for that and the, uh, is going to be at People versus uh, Bemore, B-E-M-O-R-E, that's a 2000 case. That is 22 Cal 4th, 809 and 846, and that's in accord with People versus Chapman, a case the court has cited, C-H-A-T-M-A-N. That is at 2000 uh, case, 38 Cal 4th, 384 at 385. And that case says a prosecutor may highlight the discrepancies between opening counsel's opening statement and the evidence. We intend to do this by literally not just saying defense attorney said this in opening, we're going to play the clip. Um, we want to make sure that the defense understands what we're doing, that we have the legal authority to do it, so we are not getting needless and inappropriate interruptions. Finally, I know that um, Mr. DeGarren tends to object on 352 a lot. 352 does not apply to closing argument, and I just want to make sure that if the defense is going to object, that they object consistently with California law and the California Evidence Code. Simply saying objection to something one of us says, I would like the court to direct counsel that if they do not give a proper California ground, that A, they shouldn't object, and B, it will not be addressed. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Chestnut? And you shared, uh, you, sh you, uh, you uh, provided a copy of your, your visuals to the defense. I provided all the demonstrative charts, uh, diagrams, and uh, I did not provide actual text that was argument or actual evidence in the case. I provided all demonstrative charts, pictures that are not in evidence, et cetera. And I did the same with the exception of a few things which I just merely showed, and they accepted those. All right, thank you. Mr. DeGarren? Well, uh, <clears throat> Opening statement is not evidence, and I'm not uh, clear on whether there's an authority to play opening statements uh, as a demonstrative. And we had no notice until today that that's what would be done. So we object to that in advance. I think the authority speaks for itself. Well, th there is no prohibition if you can cite that defense counsel said something in opening statement, which the courts are very clear in California you can do then it is not only more accurate, but it is more fair, it is a fair representation to actually put up what they've said. In the end, counsels were told in advance, if the court remembers, we had discussions in advance regarding what they were going to put in opening statement. The people were very clear that, you know what, you're saying things in opening statement that we do not believe are consistent with the evidence or what you're going to be able to prove from the evidence, and if you do that, it's at your own peril. The court at the time agreed and said, yep, if they end up putting something on opening statement and it, the evidence does not conform to what they've said, that that can be used against them. Did, do you have anything else, uh, uh, Mr. DeGarren? No, no. That, that the only it. thing I would add, Your Honor, is yes? uh, I'm not quarreling with the authority because we just heard the authority. Um, the court did ask them to share with us 
things that we might find objectionable. This part wasn't. Um, it's shared. There, it's shared. Wasn't shared. Shared. Correct. And just in response, Your Honor. No, what was no, shared? Just, would you relax, Mr. Lewin? What just in response, he's halfway through speaking, and you're jumping up at something, responding to something that doesn't even need, really need a response. You, uh, you, you, I asked uh, you to sh them to share demonstrative yeah. uh, evidence. I, I, we were not made aware of the fact that they intended on using clips from the opening, Your Honor. If Mr. Lewin's correct about the law, then it would be one thing to argue that this wasn't done, but to play clips of either Mr. DeGaren or myself to the jury in an effort to say that somehow we misled the jury, I think, would be objectionable. But I would, I'd like, I would have liked to have a chance to think about this and not be told this this morning. We also did tell them that we objected to one of their demonstrative uh, exhibits, and I don't know if they withdrew it or not. I did not withdraw it. I figured you'd make an objection with the court. Okay. Well, I didn't know that we were going to do it this morning, but they have some photos, Your Honor, of some insects. I think they're roaches. Um, I would suggest that the court took a look at it. The court might question whether that's an exhibit that's necessary. I, I can only imagine the context it's being presented. Um, my mind would tell me that they show one picture of one insect and then they show pictures of others. So perhaps they're going to say that the whole thing's infected with lies, which is fine to say, but the, the pictures are a little, a little over, over the top. <coughs> You're not comparing a person with an insect, are you? No, I'm comparing um, uh, how you ascertain the truth when, when a person lies in a material part of their testimony. It, it infects the entire bowl of soup as if you, know, you can't just pull the insect out and eat the rest of the soup. It sounds disgusting, Mr. Valian. Yeah, it, it, it is disgusting. All right. Oh. But I, as far as this issue of the opening, Your Honor, I'd ask the court, in light of the fact that the people waited till this morning to bring this up, to limit them to arguing that we didn't make positions from the opening if the court thinks that's the law. But to start playing us, I think that's inappropriate, Your Honor. And to, to be clear, I'm comparing the insect to the lie. I, I figured that one out. And, and Your Honor, and in response to what Mr. Chesnoff said, I don't have any obligation when the law is supportive of what I want to do to tell a defense counsel, hey, I'm going to comply with the authority that's out there. Um, I merely did it right now because I don't want to have an objection that's inconsistent with the law. Again, Your Honor, they decided they wanted to argue, they wanted to point out things in opening statement that the evidence would show. The cases are absolutely there are numerous cases and they are all consistent that that is appropriate and actually we'd be derelict in our duty if we did not point that out the idea that they're actually on tape saying this uh, it is what it is finally this will not be an attack against counsel this will be an attack against the statements that were made and not supported I think that's an important uh, distinction in other words it, it should not be used to denigrate a defense counsel. It is, of course, it, it, it seems self-evident to me. It's it's fair argument, but but uh, it's uh, enhanced a bit by by playing a, actually playing a, a tape of it. <clears throat> In light Why of the fact that you haven't seen it, and we haven't seen it, Your Honor. I think that either you we were get a chance to look at it, or the court tells them they can't do it. And the authority for that would be. Well, no, I gave, I gave you, I, uh, at the outset, I cited to you the rules of court that required uh, displaying any, uh, anything other than evidence that was uh, demonstrative. That's not evidence, it is demonstrative. Uh, and I should add, Your Honor, this is for my opening, my uh, rebuttal. I see. You're not going to do it today. But my understanding is Mr. Bailey. I don't have any clips to. Does not have from any the opening statement. Well, I'll have a chance to then read. I'm trying to read while you speak, which is, which, uh, I'm having limited uh, success with the uh, reading comprehension while you speak to me. But uh, it does appear to echo your uh, your uh, characterization. Can yeah. I give the court two more sites, please, on that same issue? Sure. And then, and then with the court's permission, Your Honor, we'll review all the sites. And perhaps we can prevail upon the state before Mr. Lewin's rebuttal to show it to us. Yes, Mr. Uh, Lewin, no, not just, I think you have to show it. But uh, tell me what, what's the number. Yes, the sites are going to be, the other two are going to be, uh, I gave the court Chapman at 38 Cal 4, 384, 385. Gionis, 
Gionis, G-I-O-N-I-S, 1995, 9 Cal 4th, 1196 at 1217. Finally, People versus Kennedy, 2005, 36 Cal 4th, 595 at 627. Finally, with respect to my uh, exhibits, as I had told the court last week, I'm going to need to have, um, I will be putting my rebuttal together after I hear from the defense. I intend to do that on Friday. Uh, at least I'll hear part of it. I won't have it done because obviously we'll only have had some of Mr. DeGuerre and none of Mr. Chesnoff. So what I would, would request is that after Mr. Chesnoff completes his closing, then what would have to happen is I'm going to then need to figure out what I'm putting in my rebuttal and then before I start, I can show the court and counsel what they're going to be. But I obviously can't do it beforehand because I don't have it. That makes sense. Okay. Finally, an agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. Good. I knew we could reach agreement that we could get to yes. Oh, and by the way, Your Honor, have you ruled on the roaches? Because it's very graphic. And I think if Mr. Bailey took a second to show it to you, I can not, you, you, you would find that it's a little over the top. Well, yeah, I think the court's description of it is disgusting. Is accurate, Your Honor. I didn't um, see it. I'm just thinking the idea of a, of a bug oh, and you're, food you're, is uh, disgusting. Well, and it's not just a bug, it's a what, cockroach? Cockroach, it's, yes. And, and just so it's clear, one of them has uh, the, the person, you can't see the face, but a person holding a roach above a bowl of soup. And the second slide has 50 roaches in soup. And how does that prejudice the defense? It's disgusting. Well, that's but how does it prejudice the defense? 352. Like, oh, well, 352 is an evidentiary uh, uh, I, I, objection. I, I, just for, he's my concern was that they were going to compare the defendant to the roaches. Which, by the way, is allowed under California authority. There's a case on well, point, in fact, where a defense was wait, called wait. I'm, I'm comparing you're not, his. You're not doing that. No, I'm no, comparing his lies to the roaches. Correct. That's it. I'm just saying, when, when counsel is saying what we can and can't do, we should also remember. Let's start uh, the, man, the man dismembered a body. Uh, so I think the cockroaches over the soup pale in comparison. Okay, we object. We believe that it's uh, improper. The court makes a ruling. Thank you. Okay. Um, it, it might be in bad taste and it may re reduce the credibility of the uh, speaker, but I, I think it's its own punishment. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Stop him from showing a picture of a cockroach and saying why. How how do you find the metaphor to describe how destructive lying is? It's it's hard to imagine what that metaphor would be. So I'll overrule it. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll do it for a moment. Our jurors are present. Mr. Durst is present with Mr. Chesnoff and Mr. DeGarren and Mr. Lewis. We have Mr. Balian, Mr. Lewin, Mr. Milius, Mr. Henderson, and Mr. Miata representing the people. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've now heard all of the evidence and most of the instructions. It's now time to hear counsel's argument. You'll recall that what counsel says is not evidence. Each counsel will outline for you his interpretation of what the evidence shows. The people will have the opportunity to make their argument. Then the attorneys for the defendant will make their arguments. Then the people will have the opportunity to reply to the defendant's arguments. And that's because the people have the burden of proof. The attorneys in making these arguments to you will be commenting upon the testimony that you heard and the evidence that was presented in this case. They will be remembering the evidence as it was presented. If their recollection of the evidence differs from your recollection, you must follow your own recollection. These final arguments are not to be construed as evidence in the case or as instructions on the law. 
They're intended to help you better understand the theories of each side and the issues you are to decide. Mr. Bailey, are you ready? I am, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you. Good morning. I thought this day would never come. <laughs> no, I mean, really, like two weeks ago, I thought it would never come. But um, it's here, and I want to thank you for your patience. Uh, when I stood up here, I saw some size, and it's hard to tell, like, if those sides were more like, oh man, Mr. Billion's giving the argument, or like, oh, Mr. Billion's giving the argument. <laughs> <laughs> but do not worry, do not worry. Mr. Lewin gave me a list of some topics he wanted me to cover, so. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. I'm joking. And I joke because as lawyers, that's kind of how we get through the serious business sometimes. And I hope throughout this trial you haven't taken offense to anything we said. We certainly didn't mean it that way. Um, this is serious business. And um, it's been a long trial. A lot of life events have passed since we started this, like almost two years ago, 18 months ago, whatever it was. We've lost some people, we've lived through a pandemic. Some of us have had good news, having children. I moved my son into college a couple weeks ago. He was in the sixth grade when I started working on this case. It's been a long time. And I think I can speak for everyone here, I hope. I know I speak for the people. I think I speak for the defense. And I believe I speak for the court. When I tell you that I started this job in November 17th of 1997, I've done many, 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 many jury trials since then. Mr. DeGuerin's probably done many, many more than me. Mr. Lewin's done many. The court, when the court was an attorney, did many trials. The court has overseen lots of trials. Collectively, collectively we've faced eye to eye many juries. And I believe it's accurate when I say that I don't think anyone here has seen a jury that is more attentive, more diligent, and honestly, more patient than you all have been. And we really appreciate that. We honestly do. If patience is a virtue, as I learned in school, you, you all are saints. You really are. When we started this trial, my hair was a little darker. Um, I had a little bit more hair. Mr. Milius here. I don't know if you remember, but when we started the trial, this is what Mr. Milius looked like. <laughs> <laughs> That's not entirely true, but the reason for the joke, the point being, my main point is that this has been a long trial, but I don't want you to be confused. Just because something is long, just because it involves a lot of evidence, just because it takes a long time to produce to you, that doesn't mean it's difficult. It just doesn't mean it's difficult. Please don't confuse the length of time it, it took to present three murders to you with complexity or difficulty. Because at its heart, this case is easy. This case is not difficult at all. This case is about a young woman who was intelligent, who was bright, who according to her family, you heard their testimony, her friends, she lit up every room she walked into. And she, she knew the love and support of a large supportive community. That's how she was raised and that's what life was like for her. And she was ambitious. And she was determined. And she didn't take no for an answer. She was a dental, worked in a dental hygiene office at the age of like 17 or 18, and then decided, you know what, I'm going to nursing school. And then when that wasn't enough for her, she said, you know what, I'm going to be a doctor. There was no stopping this woman, this young lady, I'll call her. And she met this man. She thought it was her Prince Charming. 
and they were going to be partners together. And she started down this road with him. Unbeknownst to her, it turned out to be a very treacherous path, fraught with potholes and dark corners. And she became abused. She became controlled. She became, in a single word to describe what happened to Kathleen Durst, she became absolutely dominated, an escalated a escalating pattern of domestic violence and control, emotional, financial, physical. And this bright woman who lit up every room that she walked into was wiped off the face of this earth, taken away from her family. He went to his best friend. He chose wisely. He knew she would help him given how fiercely loyal she was, given her moral code, given her loyalty, how she puts loyalty above everything else. And he chose wisely. And together, they embarked on a campaign. They embarked on a campaign to obscure the truth, to lead the investigation in a completely wrong direction. And she called the medical school on his behalf, pretending to be Kathleen Durst and she sent the police in the wrong direction. Together they did. And she almost got away, he almost got away with it. He almost got away with it. But for this reinvestigation that happened. And during this reinvestigation, it became public again. The pressure came on again. And what did he do? Like Kathleen Durst, he wiped her away. He wiped her away. She helped him get out of that jam, and the thing she got was to get a bullet in the back of her head by her best friend. As Mr. Lewin told you in opening statement, the only fortunate thing about what happened is she never saw the betrayal that he did to her. That's the only good thing that came of that day. Case is easy. Morris Black, and the defendant runs and hides and flees to Galveston. There's only one person who can lead the police to his doorstep, who knows about who he is, who knows apparently about the reinvestigation. And what does he do? Like Kathy, like Susan, he gets wiped off the face of the surface chopped up, thrown in Galveston Bay. So why are we here? This case is not simple. This case is easy. This case can be summed up to you in nine simple words. I'm going to be here for a day, probably longer than a day, because there's a lot of evidence for me to summarize for you. And I believe it's my job, even though you've heard a lot of it, it's my job to go through everything so that it makes your jobs easier. But this case, if I wanted to, can be summed up in nine simple words. It was her or me. I had no choice. That says it all. What it says is that it was him or Susan. Because either he's going to kill her or he feared she was going to go to the authorities with what she knew. This phrase is so appropriate because it says, I had no choice. For the defendant, when it comes to being accountable for his actions, to being held responsible for what he did, for letting the truth be known, and you pit that against Susan Berman's life, that's in his toolbox. That's an option. He had no choice. Sadly, it was going to have to be her. At the end of the day, when it was her or me, I had no choice, it was going to have to be her. That's why we're here. 
Why are we here? Why have we had this trial? Because when there was a man during this reinvestigation who could lead the police to his doorstep, who knew exactly where he was, living as a mute woman, hiding, there was one person who could lead the police right to him. He had a choice. And it was a simple choice. It was Morris Black or me. I had no choice. Well, sadly, it had to be Morris. It had to be Morris because he's never going to be accountable for anything he does. Why are we here? Why have we had this trial? Because when he's still on the lam, when he's bailed out of Galveston, when he's again fleeing from the truth, and there's one woman still out there who's standing on the mountaintops as we know her, who will speak the truth to anyone who will listen, who was out there in 1982 screaming at anyone who would listen to help find her friend who thought that he was responsible. And when that woman is still out there and we know Detective Becerra would have spoke to her, spoken to her, his choice was simple. It was Gilberta or me. I had no choice. Unfortunately, it was about to be Gilberta. You've got this neat five-star notebook. Why does he have Gilberta's work address? A loaded gun, another loaded gun, 80 rounds of ammunition. It's okay. In his car. It was about to be Gilberta. Why are we here? Why have we had this trial? It could be anyone. It could be Officer Dean Benner, who he tried to get to the glove box for ID, which we know what ID was in there. That ID was loaded with five rounds of ammunition. It could have been off, it's Officer Dean Benner and me. I had no choice. It could have been it's Catherine Piermetti or me. I had no choice. The loss prevention officer, he also tried to get to that car. It could be anyone who stands between my accountability or me, he has no choice. We're here because he kills witnesses. That's why we've had this trial. The defendant kills witnesses or tries to kill witnesses or plans to kill witnesses. This case is not difficult. Our burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. So please hold us to that standard. The judge <coughs> has instructed you of what that is. We're not afraid of that burden. We don't shy away from it. We embrace that standard. But we have overwhelming circumstantial evidence of his guilt. We have overwhelming direct evidence of his guilt. We have physical evidence corroborating everything these witnesses have told you. We have multiple confessions and admissions of his guilt. We have a defendant who took the stand and said whatever he thought you wanted to hear and lied repeatedly to avoid responsibility. This case is not difficult. But there are two sides to every story. And Mr. Nagarin, in opening statement, explained to you, I thought quite effectively. He, he held up, I'd never seen this done before, but as, as lawyers, um, a lot of people say lawyers are kind of like little plagiarists because we kind of steal everyone else's ideas and it's kind of true to some extent. You know, we read case law and we, we use arguments from cases and rationale from cases. We talk to other lawyers, other prosecutors, other defense attorneys and we get ideas from them. And, and we present them. But Mr. DeGarren did something and it was quite, I thought quite effective. He showed you a card, an index card. And on the front side of the card, he showed you pi and that represents the people. And then he flipped over the card, and on the opposite side of the card, he showed you the delta sign, and that represents the defendant. That's how, we, that's how we notate on our daily work, the prosecution side and the defense side. And he flipped the card back and forth, and he told you, well, this is a way to represent there's two sides to every story. And he is right. So let's look. What was presented on the people side? Facts. Facts, 
supported by witnesses, facts supported by witnesses that corroborated each other, facts supported by witnesses that were consistent with each other, facts supported by witnesses that were supported by the physical evidence, facts supported by witnesses that were corroborated by statements and admissions by the defendant himself, facts, the most importantly, that made common sense. As jurors, that's what you bring to our system of justice. We have, I believe, one of the most wonderful systems of justice in this world. And it's because of you. When you come as jurors, each one of you was selected to serve on this case because you have a unique life experience and perspective. And you bring that, and collectively, with your individual life experiences, you can evaluate the evidence and you can determine what's reasonable and what's unreasonable. And that's called common sense. That's what you bring to our system of justice. So that's what was presented on the people side. What was on the other side of this card? The fantastical creations of one man. A very imaginative man, I'll give him that. A man who can, if I wanted someone to read my kids a story when they were young, he'd be a great children's storyteller. I used to do this with my kids. I'd sit down and I'd tell them stories and I'd make them up as we went along and it would just be kind of coming out of my head. And you, get, you just get caught in the details and you just keep telling the story and it goes on and on and it changes over time. And you'd go the next night and your daughter would say, tell me that story again and you'd start to tell it, but it would be different, right? Because you can't remember all the little details you put in. But that's what we have on this side of the card. I guess I could have put Dr. Loftus on there as well. But really, I believe the defendant abandoned that. I thought the point of her was that everything all these women said, all these witnesses said about statements Susan Berman made were implanted, were suggested, came from the media, came from all good things, came from news reports, came from books, right? Well, as it turns out, apparently that was abandoned because Susan Berman was telling him those same things. But that's what we have on this side of the card. The statements, the wild imaginations of one man the wild imaginations that are unsupported by any evidence. The wild imaginations that are lies. The wild imaginations that are inconsistent with the evidence that was presented. The wild imaginations, as you're going to see as we go through it, that just fly in the face of reasonableness and common sense. This one man, he sat there, not in that chair, he sat right next to that chair. It's the same thing. He raised his hand and he took an oath to tell the truth to all of you. That's a solemn oath. It's a solemn promise. It's the cornerstone of our system of justice. As jurors, you rely on witnesses. You rely on evidence. Not prejudice, not conjecture, not passion. You rely on evidence, and you rely on what these people tell you, and that's why they tell and take an oath. It's a solemn pledge to tell you the truth. What does he think of that oath? In terms of the whole truth, if you want to leave out something that does not, uh, which makes you look bad if you tell it, but does not turn into an untruth, well, try it. Tried. Tried. Oh, he tried it all right. People's faces falling on his foot. Kathy rubbing her glove into her cheek, somehow magically causing a black eye, not even the place where he was rubbing it. Oh, he tried it like gangbusters. Well, according to that clip, at least he's saying I wouldn't lie to you about everything. It's just the part in the middle. That part in the middle, the whole truth. You can mislead a little bit, but, but I'll tell the truth. Does he really believe that? Does he really believe that? Would you lie under oath to help your case? Yes. We know otherwise now what he thinks of that oath. 
He sat here. He raised his hand. He swore to tell the truth. And then he proceeded to admit to you that he would lie under oath. What would he lie about? What kind of things? Have you lied thus far during your testimony at this trial? No. But if you had lied, given your last answer, you might not admit it, correct? He's got to think about it for a while. Correct. He would even lie about lying. That's how intricate his web of lies get. He would lie to you about whether he lied. What kind of things would he lie about? But you've also just told us that you would lie if you needed to. Can you tell me how that would not destroy your credibility? Yeah, sure. Oh, not destroy my credibility because what I'm saying is mostly the truth. There are certain things that I would lie about, certain very important things. There's certain things he would lie about. He told mostly the truth. We're, we're not here to hear mostly the truth. We're here to hear the entire truth. He would lie about important things. What are those important things? Well, you're here to decide one ultimate issue. Did you kill Susan Berman? That's a pretty important thing, you would think, right? Would he lie On about direct that? examination, do you remember the first thing that Mr. DeGuerin asked you? He asked me if I killed Susan Berman. Did you know that question was coming? Yes. And you denied it, is that right? I said no. If in fact you had killed her, would you tell us? No. He wouldn't tell you. That's truthful. What's he supposed to do? Get up there and say, yeah, I killed Susan Berman? Would he lie about killing, saying he didn't kill Kathy? And Mr. Durris, if I were to ask you right now, if you had killed Kathy, and I asked you, Mr. Durst, you're under oath right now today. Did you kill Kathy? Would you tell us? No. How about Morris? Let me ask you, Mr. Durst, if you had murdered Morris Black, would you tell us? No. The three main issues in this case that you're here to decide, that man took an oath and lied to you repeatedly and then admitted to you he would lie to you about those three things. Yet on the defense side of the card, we're supposed to trust the wild imaginations of this man when it comes to statements that help him, that help prove his innocence, that are useful to him. He will lie repeatedly. He will lie repeatedly. But there's a difference between saying, I would lie, and I did lie, right? Just because someone says they would lie doesn't mean they actually did lie. Did he actually lie to you? No, I'm, now I'm talking about your trial here. I lied on several things. And when you say several things, Mr. Durst, uh, would you agree that several is more likely many? Uh, Over I would say five. He throws the number out, five. I would suggest to you, he underestimated a bit. But did he lie to you? Yes, he actually lied to you. It's up to you to figure out what he lied about and what he didn't lie about. How difficult of a job is that going to be? Look, this clip I'm about to play tells it all. How are we supposed to figure out when you're lying and when you're telling the truth? I don't know.
He can't figure out himself when he's lying. Yet he expects you all to figure it out? Come on, use your common sense. This case from the defense perspective, the people have proven this case beyond any reasonable doubt. The defendant chose to get up there and defend himself and tell you his side of the story, his personal choice. But you got to evaluate the credibility of the person who got up there and told you that story. Look, he's admitted he lies about things. So when it comes to his innocence and saying things that are helpful to himself, I'm not saying he didn't let some of the truth slip once in a while while he's on the stand. We're going to talk about that throughout this argument. But when it comes to taking the stand and trying to help himself, can you trust him when he's admitted to you he lied and you know that he's lied to you about many things and you know they're important things and you know that they would be the things that involve the central issues in this case. Can you trust him? Let me ask you this. Say you go to a restaurant and you order a bowl of soup and your soup comes. This is going to be a little gross, but I think it, it adequately illustrates this point. And your soup comes and this is what you find in it. Do you just pick out that bug, that cockroach, toss it aside, and say, you know what? I'm just going to finish this soup. I'm just going to eat it all up. I'm going to take it in. The cockroach is gone. This soup is not tainted. This soup is not infected. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to send the soup back. You're going to want a new bowl. You're probably not going to eat at that restaurant anymore because you can't tell which part of that soup is tainted and which part of that soup is not tainted. It's all infected with lies. But it's worse in this case. Again, this is gross, but it illustrates the point. This is what he served you. This is what was served to you. Literally, you were served a bowl of cockroaches. And you were told, you pick out which ones are bad and which ones are good. You toss them aside. But you can trust the rest of that soup. Go ahead and eat it up. Lap it up. Use your common sense. You are selected because you're intelligent. You are selected because you have life experiences. You are, you are selected because you can determine the truth. And you decide what's true and what's not. So how does the defendant desperately try to deal with the overwhelming evidence of his guilt? How does he do it? What does he do? He shifts blame. He can't accept responsibility for anything. He always shifts blame. I wasn't the problem. Gilberta was the problem. Gilberta got her hooks into Kathy. Gilberta was serving her cocaine and vegetables. I don't know if you sprinkle the cocaine on the vegetables and snort it or you dip the, the vegetables in the cocaine. I'm not sure how that goes. But it was Gilberta who started this mess, not me. I wasn't the problem. Cocaine was the problem. Cocaine was causing all this stress to Kathy. Cocaine was causing Kathy to flunk out of medical school. Cocaine was causing her to abandon her life and run into a paramour's hands, arms, who apparently killed her. Not Robert Durst. I'm not responsible for anything. It was cocaine. I wasn't the problem. Kathy was the problem. Our marriage was great. We were living in Wonderland. All of a sudden, unbeknownst to me, it was like I was talking to a child. She's like, we're getting a divorce. Out of the blue, Kathy was the problem. He actually had the goal to say this. It was more like, what had Kathy done to Kathy? What had Kathy done to Kathy? Kathy didn't beat herself senseless. Kathy didn't cause herself black eyes. Kathy didn't cause herself to go running over to the arms of Ann Anderson Doyle, shaking, trembling like a cowering dog, as Ann Anderson Doyle described it. It was the defendant, but he can't accept that. Kathy was the problem. And it's worse, he's the victim. Look what Kathy did to me, poor Robert Durst. She was framing me. She was making injuries to herself. She was lying to her friends. She was out to get me. She's filing false police reports. I'm the victim. And why is he doing all this? Why is he doing all this to Kathy? 
because he's got to say, obviously I didn't kill Kathy, so obviously I didn't kill Susan. He has to do that because that's his entire motivation to kill Susan Berman. So he has to do it. He has to shift the blame. I'm not lying. He doesn't take responsibility for anything. Susan Berman's the liar. I told the truth up here on the stand with faces falling into my tip of my boot. Susan Berman's the liar. Now, defendant's strategy, his tale, it does explain some of the evidence. It's, I guess from some perspective, it's not a bad strategy. It does explain some of the evidence. It certainly would explain all of these witnesses who said Kathy told them horrible things, right? Because if Kathy's a liar, Kathy's out to get him, Kathy's out to frame him, it would explain why Kathy went to Dr. Halperin and told her him what she did. It would explain why he met with, she met with Peter Wilk and told him her husband was homicidal. It would explain all these statements Kathy said to all these people. Kathy's lying. So his strategy on some level is not horrible. But he has to do it. What's he going to do, right? But the problem is defendant's tale cannot explain other evidence. It can't explain what people saw with their own eyes. It can't explain how Peter Schwartz got kicked in the eye and suffered that injury. It can't explain Janet Fink Shaw when she walked in in the aftermath and told you what she saw and she heard Kathy say he had a gun. It can't explain Jimmy McCormick, Kathy's brother, who was there during this abuse and saw the defendant dragged his sister out of the house in front of her grandmother by the hair. So what does the defendant have to do? Well, with these people, he's got to say, well, they were lying. Right? That's what he has to do. These people were lying. And it's not hard for him to do. There's just a handful of them. He can call them all liars. His biggest problem, though, is that there was one witness he's going to have to struggle with. Because this witness was present for all of the abuse. This witness sat there, saw it all, saw the emotional abuse, saw the financial control, saw the physical domination and abuse. And this person came in here, appeared before you, and told you everything that this person saw. And it was this man. Robert Durst. In 2010, he sat down on film and he outlined all of the abuse he inflicted upon his wife financially, emotionally, physically. He outlined it for you. He appeared again in 2012 and again repeated all these incriminating things about himself. He appeared again in this courtroom and through his 2015 statements, again, repeated the emotional abuse, repeated the physical abuse, repeated the domination and control that he exerted over Kathleen Durst. This man explained it all. And so the defendant has a problem. He now has to explain that this man is lying. Right? But there's a problem. I'm sure you all see it. Because this man, it's that man. This man and that man, they're the same person. They're the same person. So how is he going to call himself a liar? How is he going to do it? He's got to call himself a liar now, right? Well, how does, he, how does he deal with this 2010 and 2012 version of himself? How does he deal with that version of himself? Andrew Jarecki told me what to say gave me secret hints. I lied because Andrew told me to lie. I was trying to increase my image on TV. Now, we could look at it on a basic level. He says, we had a telephone call around 8 AM. Every morning, we had an interview. This telephone call lasted about 15 to 20 minutes. Andrew gave me the questions and hints of what I should say. Now, let's just do the math. That's about 45 minutes of coaching. 
for over 20 hours of interviews. It doesn't make sense. It's impossible. He wasn't coached. He didn't memorize all those answers. And then repeat them again to John Lewin all those years later, verbatim. But forget about that. Because you bring common sense to our system of justice. When you go into that deliberation room right there, there's doors open right now. It's going to be open when you're done. It's going to welcome you in. Is this where they're deliberating, Your Honor? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're going to walk in that room, and I believe when you go in and turn left, there's a coat rack. Please do not check your common sense on that coat rack. No one wants you to do that. You take it in that room with you. This is his story. I was a social pariah. Whoops. Let me go back. I was a social pariah. My condo, the condo associations wouldn't take me. After what happened in Galveston, I couldn't buy in a, in a condo. I'm going to the West Coast. I'm going to the East Coast. Everyone is shunning me. On the East Coast, this little girl won't, her mother won't let her play with me because I'm that guy who killed his wife. On the West Coast, I go there and my architect, that's what he said in Galveston, my architect shunned me and didn't want me to come up to the community board meeting anymore because he'd seen what I had done, even though, talk about the architect thing, it's a totally different story today, which goes to the heart of his defense, but that's a different issue for another day, or another time, maybe today. But that was his story. I was a social pariah. I had to go on national TV, and Andrew Drecke was going to help me lift my image. So how does he do that? He's like an advertising campaign, right? You see this ad? It makes you thirsty. The sun is bright. The grass is green. There's dew on the bottle of Coke. This looks so refreshing. There's a bug. But it's the best of all bugs. It's not a cockroach, it's a ladybug. Who doesn't love ladybugs? It's a cute bug. Your Honor, I know it's time for a break, but I'm kind of thirsty right now. <laughs> I'm joking. It's a, that's what an advertising campaign, you make yourself look better. If he's a social pariah, how is he going to make himself look better? Here's the top ways, according to Robert Durst, to improve your image on national TV. You can admit you fraudulently obtained food stamps. That might make you look real good when you're uh, worth $100 million. Yeah, I got food stamps. Took them from the needy. Because I'm Robert Durst, even though I've got $100 million, or however much money he has. You can admit you emotionally abused your wife. Well, some domestic abusers might like me better. I don't think that was his target audience. You can admit you financially controlled your wife. You can admit you physically abused her. I don't think any of those are going to improve his image much. You can admit you dragged your wife by the hair in front of her family. All the mothers out there will love that. They're really going to welcome you into their condo associations. You can admit you chopped your neighbor into pieces with a giant axe and a bow saw. Oh, they're really going to welcome you into their condo association when you do that one. You can admit you had a violent argument with your wife the night she disappeared and was never seen again. I'm being a little facetious here. Well, actually, I'm not. This is all true. He said all these things. But he said all these things because that's what Drecky convinced him he needed to do to improve his image, to make you want to drink that People, drink that Coke bottle. Come on, use your common sense. It's ridiculous. Defendants' accounts of abuse were corroborated by Kathy's statements to all of those witnesses. Did Jarecki give all those witnesses secret hints of what to say? They were corroborated by witness observations of the abuse. Did Jarecki give Jimmy McCormick a hint of what to say that he saw when she dragged her out of the hair, house by the hair? Defendants' accounts of abuse were, were corroborated by documentary evidence. I guess Andrew Drecke snuck into Jacoby Hospital and doctored that medical record where Kathy had suffered blunt force trauma to her face, right? Defendants' accounts of abuse were corroborated by the physical evidence. 
The injuries, the black eyes. Did Mr. Drecky take his makeup crew in the 80s? When he was much younger and didn't even have a film company yet? And have his makeup art artists do Kathy up? Come on. His accounts of abuse were corroborated again by his statements to John Lewin right here. That lie just doesn't work. So he's now got, he's now explained why the 2010 and 2012 version of himself were lying. But now he's got a problem. He's got to explain why is the 2015 version of myself lying? Right? Well, I can't say Drecky gave him secret hints because Drecky wasn't in that room. Drecky wasn't involved. This was with Mr. Lewin. So he says, I was lying to get a plea bargain that got me back to California as quickly as possible. I want to dig into this just a little bit. What was your fear? I would be in Louisiana State Penitentiary in Goa for the rest of my life. So he told you, Angola, he does research on prisons apparently for some unknown reason. But let's assume he did that research. He learned that Angola, which is in the state of Louisiana, according to him, is the filthiest prison, the most violent prison, a vile place to be. And he's got to get out of there. So where does he really want to go? Well, the California prison system is known for treating its inmates like human beings. If I was going to live for five years, I'd far prefer to do it in the California prison system than in the Louisiana state prison system. So he's telling you, his version is, he knew he was going to, he believed he only had five years left to live at the time. He believed he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison. It wasn't about him getting out of jail. It was just about getting to the right jail. He just wants to get to California and live out the rest of his life in California. That's what he wants to do. And so what was his plan to do that? You've said before, um, and I'll ask you again, would you have pled guilty to practically anything to get out of there? I would have pled guilty to killing Susan Barman killing Kathy Durst, to killing Martin Luther King, to killing John Lennon, to killing Jack Kennedy. So that's his plan. He would have pled guilty to anything in order just to spend the rest of his life in a California prison. That's the lie he's told you as to why the 2000 version of himself, 2015 version of himself lied. That's what he told you all. That's the bill of goods he tried to sell you. At all costs, he just wants to get to California. And he would have pled guilty to Susan Berman. That's what he said. And so he wanted to make a plea bargain to do that. He was ready to plead guilty to Susan Berman, to Martin Luther King, to JFK, to anything. And in walks John Lewis. Now, not to sound mean, but a lot of people maybe aren't happy when John Lewin walks in the room. I'm being facetious. He's an awesome guy. He's been awesome to work with. But Mr. Durst sure must have been happy. Here he comes. I'm trying to get to California to spend all my days. Here comes the Los Angeles prosecutor. I'm ready to spill my guts to him, right? I'll plead guilty to JFK, to Susan Berman, whoever in a heartbeat. My savior is here. So what does he do? He's offered the chance in the very beginning of the interview. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna lay my cards on the table. Um, I'm here talking to you today because I truly believe, Bob. I don't think you feel that badly about Morris. That, that's, that, 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 that's my view. I don't think you feel badly about Morris. I don't know how you feel about Kathy, but here's what I do know. 
I know that when you killed Susan, that was not something you wanted to do. Do, do you know how I know that? I mean, are you interested in why I know that? I'm going to stay away from killing Susan. I'm going to stay away from the very topic I'm trying to convince this jury I was there to admit to, to get a plea deal and get me to California. Does that make any sense? Does that make any sense whatsoever? That's actually an adoptive admission. We'll talk about this later in the argument, but you're get, you, you were instructed by the court that you may consider adoptive admissions. When someone confronts you with something and you hear it, and a reasonable person would have denied it if it wasn't true, you as a jury may say, the defendant adopt the truth of that. He was confronted with, you killed Kathy, you killed Morris, I don't know if you feel bad about it, and you killed Susan, and he's sitting there, he's listening to it. What would someone who didn't kill Susan say? What the heck are you talking about? I didn't kill anybody. That's what he says. I'm going to stay away from Susan. I'm going to stay away from killing Susan. I'm going to stay away from the one thing I'm going to later try to convince this jury I was there to do, to get out of Angola into California. It makes no sense. He was given a pop quiz on the worst ways to get a good plea deal. The worst ways. Stay away from answering questions about Susan. Deny you wrote the cadaver note. Deny you killed Kathy. Which one of those ways is the worst way to get a good plea deal if you want to get to California? You could go with all of the above. The defendant went with all of the above. He passed. He passed. He failed in trying to lie to you because the lies are obvious when you apply your life experiences in your common sense. And as jurors, on behalf of the people of the state of California, that's what I strongly ask you and urge you to do. He was, had a, a circle of choices for every answer question he was asked. It was either a direct he hit, or it was a plea bargain, or sometimes it was I misspoke. Sometimes it was I don't know. I have been over to answer, so I'm just going to say I don't know. It's not on this wheel because I actually inserted the wrong graphic. There should be on there. Sometimes it was perjury. Sometimes there was minor perjury. Sometimes it was even minor, minor perjury. But sometimes he spun that wheel and the wrong answer came up because he couldn't remember which lie he was involved in. The people closest to Susan, everybody says, even Sarah, that if in that situation, maybe a little bit because of her dad, the whole, you know, mafia thing, that, that they think that she would have done anything to you. Mr. Durst, can you explain the answer that you gave there, saying that she would have done? Close. There's something Andrew asked me to say. So your position is that this is simply something that Andrew made you say. Is that correct? And Andrew advised me to say yes. Oh, Mr. Durst, this wasn't an interview with Andrew Jarecki. This is you and I talking in 2015. How about a different explanation? I repeated what I previously said to Andrew. He repeated five years later what he said to Andrew. He remembered that answer. He gave five years early and that's why he said it. <clears throat> or he spun his wheel and the wrong answer came up. And he got caught in his lie because he didn't, couldn't remember which version of the lie he was on. The defendant, this is what was said to you in an opening statement. Bob Durst has been running his whole life. It was repeated to you on the stand by the defendant. And the people agree with part of this statement. The defendant certainly has been running. The question is, when did he start running? He started running. He started hiding his identity. He started hiding the truth. He started evading justice when the reinvestigation began into the disappearance of his wife. What has he been running from? That's the important question. What has he been running from? Well, there's many things you can run from. You can run from an arrest. 
Certainly he did that. He certainly didn't want to get arrested. He's got $40,000 in cash. He's got $100,000 more on the way from Susie Giordano. He's got a loaded firearm. He's got a fake ID. He knows they're coming to get him. He's about to disappear forever. Clearly he's running from arrest, just like he did when he was running in Pennsylvania. What else can you run from? You can run from justice. You can run from accountability. You can run from responsibility for your actions. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But what can you really run from? You can run from the truth. The defendant runs from the truth faster than anyone you'll ever see. This was an Olympic year. If there was an event for running from the truth, he'd be on top of the podium stand. He sprints from the truth. He was running from the truth when he waited five days to report Kathy missing. He was running from the truth when he lied to Detective Strzok about speaking to her on the phone at her apartment the next day. He was running from the truth when he fled to Galveston, lived as a mute woman. He was running from the truth when he executed Susan Berman to keep her mouth shut over what he had done. He'd been running from the truth when he killed Morris, executed him, so the police couldn't find him. He certainly runs from the truth. How else has he tried to run from or obscure the truth in this case? He's attacked the victims. It's called turning the tables. <clears throat> if you attack the victims, if I call Kathy a coke addict, and that's why she ran away, if I say Susan Berman was just a liar, an exaggerator, if I say Morris Black, a guy who was just his worst fault, it seems, was selling or giving away glasses, free glasses to people who needed them, and when someone smoked cigarettes or did something he didn't like, refused to give them the glasses, right? You call that guy violent, and you say, he attacked me. You attack the victim and you turn the tables, and you focus the jury's attention on something other. See, over here, he wants you to look over there in that corner on all the faults of the victims. Look over there at all the faults of the victims, and ignore over here this giant, massive pile of evidence showing he's guilty. The worst attack, the worst assault in this case was on Kathleen Durst. And I, I hate to say it because on many levels this is not true, but I'm going to say it anyway. Of all the horrible things he's done, of all the vicious and vile acts you've heard, one of the most atrocious things that this man, Robert Durst, has done in this trial is the way he's attacked Kathy. It's bad enough he killed her. It's bad enough he abused her. It's bad enough he tortured her. But he has the gall to come in here and attack her over and over, assault her over and over with his words, when we all know she's dead and cannot defend herself. He calls her a cocaine addict. He calls her a medical school dropout, a flunky. He calls her someone who just ran away from her life, abandoned her family who she clearly loved. Why does he do that? What doesn't he want you to look at? Who's the genesis of this attack? I don't want you to sit here and somehow think that the defense attorneys have done anything improper in this case. You know, just because Mr. DeGaran gets up there and says, oh, you know, asks repeatedly about cocaine use, etc., Mr. DeGaran's not doing anything improper. Mr. DeGaran is doing his job. These are good lawyers. They're good people. But they didn't create this attack. This was started in 1982 by the defendant. By the defendant. He started this attack. What does he do? Excuse me, Your Honor. I apologize, Mr. Bailey. Apparently, the screen has stopped. Oh. OK, let's get it. Sorry. That's okay. Maybe it was. Do you need five minutes? Uh, 
can we take the break then? And sure. Not that you plan, but. It's okay. Okay, then we will uh, take a 15 minute break now. More efficient that way. Do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with.